everyone, well, welcome, and thank you very much for being part of this webinar. My name is Jessica Bogdan. I'm the EFMA NYC Chair for the Sustainability Committee. Um, this event is being recorded and attendees are on mute, but you'll have an opportunity to ask questions by writing them down in the chat section um, at the bottom of your screen and our panelists will answer them at the end of the webinar. Um, we would like to take this opportunity to thank our IFMA NYC annual sponsors. With their support, it allows the chapter to provide our members with educational programming, networking opportunities, and special events. If you are interested in becoming an annual sponsor or an event sponsor, please contact Janine Brennan at sponsorship at ifmanyc.org. Again, thank you to our sponsors for making all of this possible. So I'd like to introduce our moderator. Sophia Montgomery is also a member of the Sustainability Committee. Um, she's a workplace experience expert with a passion for creating inclusive, exciting, and productive work environments, both in person and remotely. She is skilled in all areas of employee experience and specializes in programming and events. Sophia has also recently, and this is really impressive, <laughs> completed not one, but two build office build outs during the pandemic. Um, one was for 200,000 square feet for Just Works, and the other is with her current company, Figma. Sophia, over to you. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I found in my role as a workplace manager, um, as I've gone back to the office twice now in the last six months, and um, that it's a really great opportunity to do some change management and um, kind of reset some expectations. And while we're coming in, starting fresh, it's a great time to, to make some sustainable changes. Um, so we're just gonna go ahead and walk through a day in the life um, in the office with cleaning, cafes and recycling, printing and lighting with our incredible panelists here. Um, so thank you, Anne-Marie, David, Al, and Barry. Um, first off, I'd like to introduce Anne-Marie Fleming, an incredible change management expert from CBRE. Thank you for joining us, Anne-Marie. Thank you, Sophia. I'm really excited about today's program and especially talking about change management and how it can be utilized to reinforce this sustainability return to work checklist. Many people think that change management is only appropriate for organizational wide transformational changes and projects. Nothing can be further from the truth. Um, today, I'm gonna to share with you some principles for change management that facility managers can use to get employees to buy in and participate in these sustainable policies and practices. When a uh, FM leverages these tools, um, it just makes it that much easier to get employees to be engaged with the clean green cleaning, sharing spaces, recycling, you know, how they use the printing, um, their, even their energy use and their lighting programs. And really the plan is to build awareness for how the actions that each employee takes has an impact um, for the organizational organization for them to achieve their new green behaviors that will support ongoing change, successful change programs. So whenever a new change is introduced, it's very natural for employees to ask the question, why is this happening? So doing something as simple as giving the reasons behind the why can go a long way to make the change, to build that support for the change. Um, another really critical step is to gain senior leadership support. Um, when senior leaders are visibly engaged in communicating and supporting the change, um, employees feel much more aligned to it. Um, when senior leaderships are not supporting it, it can be very difficult to get the employees motivated to change their behaviors needed to sustain the project. Um, the third part is really appealing to the employee's personal motivation so that they opt in and choose to be engaged and participate in the program. You know, we've all experienced somebody telling us what to do. It's much less effective than when you appeal to their personal motivation and they want to participate. You know, research shows that, you know, using the carrot and stick method may achieve short-term results, but it does not result in lasting long-term sustained change. So, however, rewards programs can be very effective 
for building excitement to kickstart a new change program um, as employees are developing the habits. And the last piece I'd like to point out is about culture. You know, at the end of the day, change is happening at the individual level, but by recreating a company culture that's environmentally focused, the organization identifies itself as this is who we are, this is how we do things. And that combined with that senior leadership support is a great formula for changing a company's culture. And the very last point I would like to make is that today more and more of our clients and consumers are expecting more from us as companies to focus on sustainability, to tell our story because it's what they care about. So with that in mind, I'm gonna hand the, um, the mic off to David who's gonna take us through green cleaning. Thank you so much, Amory. And we'll be coming back to you for tips throughout. Um, so hi, David. Um, Managing Director of Mr. Hudson's. Great to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, excellent intro there by Emory. Um, green cleaning and cleaning in the in the age of COVID. So we know that CDC is updating their guidelines daily. In fact, we had an update yesterday um, in regards to the the Delta variant of um, of COVID. Um, Apparently all new cases of COVID, well, not all new, but about 95% of the cases of COVID now are the new Delta variant in the US, which is scary and interesting. Um, people who are fully vaxxed are experiencing very mild cases of COVID and people who are unvaxxed are, received, are experiencing serious cases, serious cases of COVID. With that in mind, you know, we've been trying to make sure that we keep our staff here at Mr. Hudson's educated um, around techniques, protocols, et cetera. And we've been trying to work with our clients who have come back to office, which who are very few at this moment in time. Um, larger clients are still reluctant to bring everyone back. So it's it's been complicated that way. Um, so from our end, we've been focusing on teaching our staff even more than we normally do, the difference between disinfecting and cleaning. And I think this is a very important thing to know for FMs and for people who are working in, in the offices, warehouses, et cetera. Cleaning. Amazing. This, yeah. Sorry, what so, is exactly that difference? No worries. So cleaning takes all of the contaminants oils, et cetera, from surfaces. This is, this is an important step before you disinfect. So if you disinfect without cleaning, you've basically touched the, the, the top surface, but you've not cleaned the, the bottom surface because disinfecting does not remove oils from surfaces. And when you put your hands on the desk or you know you put a cup on the desk, everything that that touches the surface seals in what is what is on that surface to begin with. So the first thing you need to do before you disinfect is clean. And this is one of those things that even before COVID we paid attention to, but because of COVID we're paying even more attention to it now. Um, and you know we see we see a lot of companies and a lot of people just coming in and spraying foggers and and saying hey we've done our job we've disinfected well yes and no 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 you've not you've disinfected the top surface but not the bottom surface so I think educate educating staff in particular um, as well cleaning staff from my end but also the coworkers in your space is really important so that they can actually throughout the day also help themselves when there's when the cleaning staff are not in their space by just cleaning their surface and making sure that they give um, bacteria, viruses, et cetera, a, a less hospitable place to survive. Um, as we, in the beginning, we thought COVID spread on surfaces, but now we realize that that's about a 5% chance of that but you know five percent is still five percent absolutely um and is there anything you found that's been helpful in letting employees you know feel safer in the office yeah absolutely so the clients that we have that are back to office what they've been doing is posting cleaning schedules in the bathrooms um 
by the elevators if the if the elevators inside their space um, by the by the kitchens that just give times of cleaning and this is a way and we find that people are really jazzed about knowing when spaces are clean and they've been trying to follow you know you have a rush for the bathroom <laughs> at the top of every hour because people want to be the first to use it after it's been cleaned. So that's in the kitchen as well. It's been actually quite funny to watch <laughs> from, my, from my point of view. Um, we are, we're also focused on making sure that our staff still wears PPE in, your, in, in client spaces. So PPE being masks, gloves, you know, um, that good stuff. We're still doing temperature checks. I know that you know, CDC has said if you're fully vaccinated, this is not necessary, but we're still keeping those protocols up until such time as we're well past any variants um, coming Amazing. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as a facility manager, what can I do to make your job easier? Uh, clean desk policy for me is, is one of the biggest one, biggest ones. You know, we, we come in usually after everyone is gone. And if we come into a, a desk full of paper, we're not usually going to touch it for fear of damaging the paper when we spray a chemical in the air or mixing up papers that are uber important as has happened with one of my architectural clients who you know, had a major fit that we moved some papers around in an attempt to clean his desk. So clean desk policy would be awesome. You know, the, the less on the desk, the better we can go about our business. Amazing. Anne-Marie, do you have any tips on helping to institute that policy? Uh, yeah, it really starts with understanding why it's important to clean the desks, uh, not just to make it easier for the cleaning crews to come in and be able to properly clean every surface, but also you don't want to be leaving out sensitive documents. So making sure that people are adhering to um, clearing those spaces. I know we're going to be talking shortly about hoteling um, and when those spaces are going to be used by multiple people, it just frees it up for other people to have full access to the entire space. Um, so we, we build that into our change communications training and program for sure. Amazing. Yeah, we're actually doing um, hoteling, which at first some employees thought was kind of counterintuitive because they wanted like, you know, to know their space was clean. Um, but when we institute hoteling and the clean desk policy, you know absolutely that every desk is getting thoroughly disinfected at the end of the night. Um, and we also have a really clear record of who was where, um, which we've found is really necessary. Um, another thing I wanted to, to touch on with you is cleaning products. I feel like everyone is just like jumping for like the most toxic thing to make sure they're you know killing COVID. You've done your research. Tell us what we need to know. Okay, so this product, um, this company, Envirox, is a product I've been using since I started the company um, eight years ago um, after doing some heavy research. And I suffer from asthma myself. So when I came from corporate, I tried to look for products that were easy on my lungs and would kill you know, influenza, most importantly, when it comes to office spaces, because flu takes people out. Colds and flu are the biggest um, things that, that cause um, absenteeism throughout the year in companies. So we look for, pro for a product that would kill that particular um, virus. So we came across um, this Envirox product. It's a hydrogen peroxide based product. And it, you can mix it in three different, two or three different um, dilutions. And it, as you can see from, from its um, claims here, it kills hepatitis, influenza, et cetera. And it's now been proven to also kill um, COVID, COVID um, the strain of COVID. So we use this product, we dilute it. Um, it's environmentally safe, which is one of the biggest things for me is to make sure that any product that we put into the system, number one, won't affect the people who are who have to sit there all day and breathe it in. And number two, won't affect the environment when it washes into the, the water system. So we use that and then Envirox came out with a, 
and non-acid disinfectant specifically for COVID-19. And we've been using that in combination. So we clean first with the H2 orange and then we disinfect with the, with the um, non-acid disinfectant. And we found this combination so far to be quite useful um, in taking care of clients. Incredible, thank you. Good, good to hear from the experts. Um, we don't need the Clorox wipes everywhere. No, no, we do not. And my fear, by the way, is that in about five years, they're going to say, oh, you know, all that hand sanitizer you rubbed on your hands. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's one of my biggest fears. And by the way, the best way to get rid of COVID, forget hand sanitizer, wash yeah. your hands. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, any parting thoughts? No, I, I mean, I, like I said, you know, just be safe. Uh, I, I suggest continue to wear your mask when indoors um, as much as possible. The Delta variant is not fun. And, you know, wash your hands. Thank you so much. And thank you for taking care of your staff out there. I know it's been quite the year at Mr. Hudson's. Craziness. Yeah. Um, so moving ahead through the employee workday. We walk in, the space is clean. Um, where are we going next? Um, we're probably going to the cafes and we're going to our desks. And throughout the day, what is having the biggest impact on our sustainability is probably recycling. Um, I'm finding, as I just got back, that it seems as if everyone has just totally forgotten how to recycle. Um, and and we're, we're doing much worse at contamination than we were a year and a half ago when we were last in the office. Um, so I'm starting back at square one with the most detailed signs and with over communicating and over messaging um, and finding that it's it's at least a great opportunity to kind of start fresh with all of this since it's not so much a change. Everything is kind of just new even though we did it a year and a half ago. Um, so I'm just getting really detailed and making sure those bins are color coded and are really clear um, and making sure that the, the directions are on the top and not on the side or right above it. That's really helpful for, um, you know, just those like seven seconds that you might get people to read things. Um, and the other big change that I've made coming back is, um, is looking into to trying reusable dishware. Um, this obviously, can be a really big ask of a facility manager um, and of your employees if you don't have a dishwasher. Uh, if you do have a dishwasher and you have the staff to be you know, running it and changing it out, then it's a no brainer. You're gonna save money. It's so much easier. You're gonna have way less waste. Um, and safety wise, um, you know, something sanitized from a dishwasher is absolutely as safe as a single use plastic. Um, what I would say is if you, you know, if you don't have dishwashers, you don't have room to put them in, I know that can be too big of an ask, um, but none of us stay in one office building for long. So it's just a really good thing to always have in mind if you're gonna be moving, if you're gonna be doing any renovations, that's always like top on my list of a change that I'd love to make. Um, and luckily the office I, we just moved into has a dishwasher. So it was really seamless. Um, but in terms of, of if you don't have that, um, one problem that I see all the time when I visit other offices is um, folks trying to be sustainable by getting compostable dishware. And it'll be, you know, those plastic cups that are made out of corn plastic. And um, those are not recyclable because they're not plastic, but they look like plastic. So you folks are gonna put them in the stream and contaminate um, your recycling. As you, as you can see here, uh, cross-contamination is, is a huge issue um, and, and that's a big contributor to it. So I think along with your signage, it's really important to know exactly what you're providing in the office. And then you can, from there, have specific signage to really guide folks in the right direction. Um, but this is probably the biggest change management issue we, we come across. Um, so Anne-Marie, any advice there? Yes, appealing to the idea of the why, I see that we've referenced the local law. Um, when this new law went into um, effect, tenants became um, responsible to make sure that 
their employees were properly um, um, putting their recycling paper and metal plastics into the right bins. So there is a ramification for the organization. They will have to pay fines if somebody comes through an inspector and finds that they have not properly recycled. So communicating out the um, potential risk for the organization can also be a helpful motivator to get people to get on board and support the program. And maybe even considering adding a contest to make it fun. I know other organizations have done similar efforts um, where they sort of track how much um, recycling they correctly capture and then communicating that out to employees. And that can be a way to make it a fun process. Absolutely. Yeah. Any data you can show um, can be really helpful. I know that, for instance, I think at Etsy, they um, weigh all of their waste so that they can show, you know, this is how many pounds of trash we um, accumulated today. And that can really like sink in for folks. And here, like we said, here's, you know, the basic signage, um, which is going to be the clearest and the most helpful. I recommend just putting that into whatever your company's brand is, you know, changing the font, making it just pop a little more. And then I love these really simple bins with the color on the top and those labels on the top. That's going to be the most effective um, as opposed to like a sleek looking silver bin where they all kind of look the same. Um, I think, you know, just as clear as possible for folks. Um, all right. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, we are going to move on here to um, sustainable printing. Al Maline, thank you for joining us. Al is a senior partner at Campbell and Partners Consulting and a printing and sustainability guru. Um, so Al, I would love to hear from you what your um, suggestions are for how we can green up printing as we get back to the office. Uh, thanks, Sophia, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Over the past, um, I guess, 12 to 16 months, we, we've all pretty much gone from working in an office where everything is readily available and kind of at your beck and call to just copy, print, and do whatever you need to do with regards to your, um, your work. And then we had to abruptly all pack our bags and go home. Uh, some companies were able to offer uh, some of their employees a, a printer at home, but many did not. So we took a look at how we could take advantage of what we've just gone through for the past X number of months, now that many companies are gonna start going back. And we looked at a small, medium and a large uh, task. A small change, which can be implemented, what we call a think before you print campaign. Uh, it's free. And for those of us who do not have the luxury of having any kind of, you know, kind of robust printer, because uh, offices have those big copiers that are printers as well as big work group printers, but you may have gone home to a little small $50 or freebie bubble jet printer that the cartridges cost more than the printer. Uh, we've probably printed less uh, from home over the past X number of months. And the reality is, you know, you probably then uh, analyze, do I really need to print that document? It's gonna take 20 minutes to print three pages. So you probably didn't. So you probably learned to read more on your computer monitor, or if you were lucky enough to buy a big monitor to attach to your computer, you cannot read everything on uh, on your screen versus printing. Uh, that's a, a small little change. It's free Absolutely. and it's very easily uh, administered by just telling people think before you print. Yeah, I think a lot of younger folks, especially like didn't have printers at home. Um, so really, hopefully we've all gotten used to printing a lot less this year. True. It, it's also generational. You know, as you said, like younger kids uh, are more used to working with their uh, smart devices, tablets, and things of that sort. But you know, as we get a little older, as you can see, I wear glasses at this point. You hit about forty-five or fifty, all of a sudden you can't really see things, no matter how big you make them on your iPad or your iPhone uh, or your Samsung, whatever it is. Uh, you know, reading one word per screen on your device is not really sufficient. So a lot of the, I hate to put it like this, but a lot of the older generation still likes to print things out because it's totally. easy for them to read, then not. And then reality is as those 20 year olds become 30 and 40 and 45 and their eyes start to go, they're not going to want to get rid of that printer like a lot of the older people do. So that's like one of the things that kind of happens in many offices. Absolutely. Media the medium change that we looked at is something called secure printing. 
Um, every device, regardless of manufacturer, has the ability to institute secure printing, and it's accomplished by adding a uh, nominal security code, which you choose yourself from your computer. So your IT department can uh, show you through a couple of steps how to put in this uh, security code at your computer in the document that you want to print. Uh, the nice thing is your device uh, that you're sending this security code to won't print until you actually go up to that device and actually manage and put in that uh, security code you put in uh, from your computer workstation. So the ROI you could get on something of this is the fact that you know, um, you may have seen people run to the copier, which is now acting as a printer to try and get their prints because um, they know that everybody's printing at the same time and they get commingled and they're lost. And then all of a sudden somebody trashes it. They have to figure it out. So what they do is they'll throw it out and they'll print it again, which leads to a lot of waste. So by doing it this way, your job sits resident on that device you've articulated to go to. And now it's not going to be released until you actually put in your code. You could save approximately 10% on your cost, uh, which is nice. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, the example we've used here is if you save 100,000 pages, you've saved 10 trees. And we all know the benefit of having more trees and more green out there to help us with, you know, uh, I guess the oxygen versus the carbon dioxide. The only downside of something like this is the fact that depending on your IT and what they do with regards to sweeps, because sometimes the computers aren't fully locked down, They'll go out there at the end of the night, end of the week, whatever, and they may erase all of those security codes and then you have to re-put it in. It's a minor glip, but the reality is it's also free and really non-invasive, uh, non but it's something that you can adhere to as a medium change. If you go to the next slide, please. The Thank you, Al. And that, that medium change sounds like it's... Um a really great um, possibility and you just kind of need to collaborate with your IT team. So that probably depends, you know, depending on who you're collaborating with and, and what exactly your setup is. Um, but what, tell us about this follow you print system. Yes, um, the, the last change is a little more extensive and it does have a cost factor behind it. It's, it's a product called follow you print. Um, follow you print is something that is either made by the individual manufacturers uh, you know, Rico, Canon, Xerox, whomever, uh, or it's done by a third party, depending on whether that manufacturer doesn't have their own uh, personal software to do this. Uh, the software is installed on your uh, computers as well as your devices such that you can either tap your ID badges if you use them in your office, the key fobs, the ID badges, the HID cards, or you could use a pin code to release your print job. And the thing about this is, uh, again, with COVID and all the discussions regarding around cleaning and things of that sort, um, some people may be a little leery about touching the copier because everybody touches it, which is also not acting as your printer and scanner for that matter. Here you have the ability to literally send your print job to the copier with follow you print. It's sitting uh, in the cloud, but then you can just tap your badge and your badge will then officially just release your print job and you'll never have to touch your device. So that's one of the things that from a COVID perspective, it does have that uh, additional benefit. The way that something like follow you print is instituted is that um, an assessment is usually done of your facility. Take a look at the number of printing devices you have. And one of the key things that are usually recommended in something like this is the fact that all personal printers will be recommended to be removed. Um, you know, that's one of the biggest uh, challenges that companies adhere to. But the fact of the matter is, this is one of the things that is the benefit of that because you're reducing the number of print devices. But now all your devices are interconnected uh, behind your secure firewall. So for security perspective, it's 100% secure as well as you're in 100% compliance of all the new security measures that are going out there, especially if you have a company that's based in Europe or has business in Europe. The European Union requires some kind of security. This is part of that. So you would actually now be able to check that box. Various states in the US are actually implementing their own security policies. New York, one of them, California, another, who are very, uh, I guess you could say progressive with regards to that. But they're all interconnected as one. So I guess, you know, we probably all experienced the fact that you've sent the print job to a copier and it's got a paper jam and it's down and your print job is stuck behind it. So you get frustrated, you kick the machine, you curse, you try and get it out, you can't get it done. 
Now you got to find another device that you may or may not be interconnected to and now print it. The nice thing with this solution is the fact that every single device is connected as one. So if your print job was sent, it's not sent to a device, it's sent to a holding space. When you go up to any one of the devices, anywhere located within the building, you can now tap your badge and release your job. The return on the investment for something like this is the fact that you could reduce your printing or your overall printing by anywhere from 20 to 50%. It's reduce great. your color printing by over 50%. Uh, you also have a fewer number of devices which use less energy. So you usually get a minimum of a TCO, a total cost of ownership, as a minimum reduction of about 15%. And uh, for those of you familiar with like Gartner and things of that sort, they talk about the fact that copying and printing is usually one of the top four or five expenses in an organization. So if you can reduce it by 15, 20%, that's usually a significant amount of money. Um, the way that this is monitored to show how the sustainability of this product is now working is the fact that you could have a monthly or quarterly review where you could assess and take a look hard copy as to how many prints you've now done, compare it to what you've done before you actually implemented something like this. So you could physically see through the computer that's going to keep track of every print that's been done, every page that's been done, every copy that's been made. You will physically see what that savings is, and then you can correlate that into dollars, uh, more efficiency, faster workflow, things of that sort. Whenever we do these kinds of, uh, and my firm does these kinds of implementations, uh, and we go through the follow you print through what we call a complete print solution, uh, we usually talk about our change management piece, which is a change within a three week time period. Uh, within a three week time period, you could turn a task into a habit by consistently doing it every day um, you know, for that three week time period. So when we usually implement something like this, the first week, people are always complaining about the fact that they've now lost their personal printer. They have to walk seven feet further down the hall to get to their new device and so on and so forth. Week two, they start to realize, hey, this device is now full color. It's a hundred pages a minute you know, versus 20. It's much faster. It's much more efficient. When I scan my job, it shows up within two seconds in my own personal computer versus 15, 20, 30 minutes. By the third week, there's no comments anymore. They're just used to it at that point. So within that three week, you turn a negative possibly into a positive because of what they've always had. And then usually they just embrace it. And now the fact that there's all this extra money, depending on your company, they could be distributing it to you in raises and extra bonuses, extra perks, extra bennies. But there's a lot of benefits to something like this. Totally. Amory, any other change management tips in implementing these changes? Yes. Um, we spoke earlier about hoteling. Many of the clients that I'm working with right now are adopting hybrid or activity-based working where people don't have a place to call their own and to store papers. So to support that mindset set change, we encourage them and we have a whole training about how to um, move to paperless meetings. So instead of printing out 20 copies of a presentation, the materials are shared in advance for people to review. When they come in, it can be put up on a monitor for you know, comment and, and edits in real time versus having all this wads of paper that are gonna be recycled. Um, the other thing we recommend is that they go to digital storage versus you know, pap paper storage. Many firms are removing their file storage out of the office. So if they have the capacity to do scanning um, or if they're gonna be using an offsite um, archiving service, they do need to obviously align with their internal um, retention policy, but we help clients to do that. The last thing that we help them with is encouraging, strongly encouraging them to adopt a, a digital signature technology. Um, this eliminates the need to print a document, sign it, scan it, and send it back. Um, it's more efficient, it's a time savings, and obviously it doesn't waste paper. Um, and I saw on his last point, Al pointed out, you know, taking print and copy rooms off of designs. And I'm working with a client right now who's um, moving into a brand new headquarters. Um, the construction continued during the pandemic. Everybody found themselves working at home with no access to printers. So they've actually gone ahead and taken all their print and copy rooms off of their designs and freed up that space for other uses. You know, collaborative spaces, phone rooms, huddle rooms, um, which is a great real estate savings and a more effective use of the space. Amazing, absolutely, yeah. And the more you know, the more we work remotely, and the more you are collaborating with folks in other offices, 
you know, or maybe collaborating with someone that's working from home. It's just, um, you know, we've, we really have to find ways to, to collaborate digitally. Um, so it's a, it's a really good time to be making that change, I think. Um, well, thank you so much, Al. This was really interesting. Um, next up, we are gonna talk lighting, um, bringing on our lighting expert from GE Current, Barry, thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Sophia. Thank you for having me today. Absolutely. Um, so can you share some info on, you know, what savings we can get through switching to more sustainable lighting? Um, and also, I'd just love to add that, you know, if anyone out there is, has their office closed right now and is planning to reopen, what a great time to be able to go in and make some of these changes, you know, without paying overtime for, for evening work and stuff. Very, very, very. It's very true. Uh, so yeah, I'm Barry with a company called GE Current, a Daintree company. We're lighting manufacturers. And one of the things I want to talk about today is the opportunities as you reopen your office and the offices spring to life again, you have this chance to reevaluate your lighting because you may be using older technology that uses more energy. And in this economic challenges that we're all going through now, a great way to save is to invest in new lighting because not only do you save money because the fixtures use less energy, our utility in New York City, Con Edison, is offering robust incentives to do that. And the reason that a utility offers incentives is they wanna create market transformation. They wanna basically offset the cost of a new type of LED fixture um, to make it more affordable. And essentially how these utilities, including Con Edison, have all this money is that you've been paying into it for years. Uh, when any rate payer, uh, be a residential rate payer, or in this case, a commercial rate payer, on the bottom of your bill, pennies to the dollar, there's something called a systems benefits charge. And utilities have been collecting this money for decades. Originally it started so utilities could build more power plants. Well, nobody's building more power plants today. Nobody wants them in their neighborhood. And uh, what fuels do we use to uh, create the steam that turns the turbines that creates electricity? Or are we using fossil fuels? We can't use nuclear. So Con Edison believes the next power plant actually exists in our existing office buildings if we could cut energy consumption 40, 50, 60%. But cutting energy consumption isn't enough. You have to replace your lighting with architectural lighting, with lighting that is light levels are perfect, color is perfect, because if you have shadows, if you have low light levels, it causes fatigue, and among employees, fatigue causes mistakes, it causes people to get headaches, they miss work, so there's a lot at stake when you uh, change lighting. So just give you a brief, uh, a little glossary term of what's going on with when you hear rebates and incentives. A rebate is an instant discount. So if you're part of some um, store, store loyalty program, you have a little QR code on your phone, you flash the code when you make a purchase and you get an instant discount, that's a rebate. You really didn't achieve anything. You did nothing other than produce a QR code or a coupon. An incentive, you have to work for the incentive. You have to achieve something for the incentive. So in lighting, what you're achieving, you're achieving reduced energy consumption. And there's two types of rebates. We're gonna focus on one, but just for your knowledge, there's a rebate that's called a prescriptive rebate and a rebate that's called a custom rebate. I know I say rebates. Rebates and incentives are used interchangeably. I just wanted you to know technically what the differences were. So a prescriptive rebate is like a, uh, you go to the doctor, doctor, my throat hurts, gives you a prescription. Take these many pills for these many days. Take them all on these many days. So a prescriptive rebate in lighting would be change these many fixtures, you get this much money, case closed. There's a bounty on each lighting fixture. You change 10 fixtures, there's a rebate of $50 in each fixture, you get a $500 rebate. You get 100 fixtures, you get a $50, a $5,000 rebate. That's how it is. Custom is different. Now, facility managers that are more sophisticated or their plants are more sophisticated or their company plans are more sophisticated, there's something called a custom rebate where you could roll the lighting savings into a new HVAC system or into cogeneration, and they're gonna use the entire, what's called building envelope. How did the building itself consume less energy? It's a little more complicated. Today, we're gonna to speak about what's on the next slide, which is the Con Edison commercial rebate. 
And uh, es essentially, it's very simple to do. Uh, I want you to all understand, you don't need to hire third party people to implement this for you and pay them a fee. You don't need to pay engineers to come in after the fact and make sure what you did is right. It's a very simple program. So Con Edison has a program, it's on their website, on their title, on their bar, uh, across their website, there'll be a, a rebate bar, you click on it, and you're gonna get this program called the Consolidated Edison Commercial Industrial Energy Efficiency Program. If you call it the Con Ed Rebate Commercial Program, it's fine, but it's a commercial program. There's residential programs, there's retail programs, that doesn't help us. We're gonna focus on the commercial program. And what you do is, if you're a rate payer, now remember, you have to pay a utility bill. Your company has to pay a utility bill. If your company doesn't pay a utility bill, it's not for you. So you can't hang out in front of the Empire State Building and say, hey, I got these 102 floors here, I want a rebate. It doesn't work that way. You have to be a uh, rate payer for your property. So what you do is you essentially call up Con Edison they have account managers who only do this. And these aren't the guys that climb the utility poles. They're not the guys who work in the manholes. Those, that's a whole different trade. They have people uh, that visit you and they're field representatives. And they will look at the lighting that you have now and they will register the project right now and they'll inspect, the, uh, they'll inspect it, okay? And now it's time for you to make a purchase. Now, how do you know what to purchase when you deal with lighting? Well, the easy thing is you already have relationships with electrical supply houses where you're already buying your switches and your wiring and your drivers and your ballast and replacement bulbs, things of that nature. These are the people where you buy lighting fixtures from. So you don't have to go to a separate authorized place because it's not uh, marketed by a particular store. So what you're going to do is you're gonna go to the people who assist you with your lighting normally. And if, if you need my help, I'd love to be able to point you in the right direction. And you get the lighting and you have to make sure the lighting is an approved list from something called the Design Lights Consortium. So there's two third party um, document people out there. One is the DLC. The DLC concerns commercial lighting. The other is Energy Star. Energy Star gives a uh, accreditation to products that could be used in the home or in the office. So what's used in a home and the office? Recess lighting, cans. So well, you could use recess lighting in your home, you could use recess lighting at work. Energy Star needs to certify those fixtures. Track lighting, people use track lighting at home, use track lighting at work. Even though it's two separate types of track lighting, the track lighting category, the recess lighting category needs to be Energy Star approved Anything that's the panels that you see in the ceiling, your two by fours, your one by fours, your hallway fixtures, um, those fall under the DLC, which is Design Lights Consortium. You could go to the Energy Star site, you can go to the DLC site, but when you purchase the lighting fixtures or you start looking at the lighting fixtures, the specification sheets of any of the lighting fixtures will in fact say if it's DLC or Energy mm -hmm. Star listed. And the other thing I wanna point out to you is uh, the, once the installation is done, if it's your own maintenance team that does the installation, that's fine. If you use your regular electrical contractor, that's fine. If you hire an electrical contractor, that's fine. But just remember, it's between you and Con Edison. You don't need to bring in, unless you want to, a third party consultant to help you implement this. And finally, after the job is installed, the Con Edison field rep comes back verifies that everything you said you were going to change is in fact changed. That you didn't leave <laughs> old fixtures in the space. And when that happens, then they will verify it and then a check will go to you. You do not need to hire anybody to verify what you did. It's between you and, and Con Edison. Amazing, this, this is so helpful. And what I love about this is that um, you don't actually need change management with your employees. Um, we love you, Anne Marie, but we don't need you on this one. Um, the change is done. Um, so really all I need as a workplace manager is buy-in, you know, to get the money up front to make this change. Um, so I'd love to hear more about return on investment. Right. And then the other huge mm -hmm. advantage that this is giving you, right, is that you don't have to be changing these bulbs. What's the, what's the difference, you know, between an incandescent and an LED? Like how, how many more months are we talking that I don't have to have oh, anyone talking, up on a ladder? Oh, you're, you're talking years and years. In fact, if you went to the Incredible. next slide, um, I could give you two examples. Now, Perfect. full disclosure, I'm with a company called GE Current, a Daintree company. 
there are hundreds of companies that are approved for this. There are thousands of fixtures that are approved. I'm from GE Current. I guess that's what I'm going to show you today. But full disclosure, there's a ton of people that are available. So to answer Sophia's question here, the difference between LEDs and incandescent is two different technologies. Incandescent is essentially what Thomas Edison invented in 1879. Fluorescent is the same lighting uh, technology that GE invented and, and showed at the 1939 World's Fair in Flushing Meadows. So you're dealing with older technologies. However, those are technologies with this physical filaments or electrodes that burn out. With LEDs, just to make matters simple, LEDs are photons and electrons trading spaces on a, on a substrate. So there's no real moving parts. That's how they glow. So the, uh, the other question that you have is what's the difference is LED, when they say LEDs last forever, nothing lasts forever. But what happens is it lasts for 50 to 100,000 hours, depending on the fixture. Now what's 50 or what's that in real life? 50,000 hours, 100,000 hours. There's 8,740 hours in a year. If you use your fixtures 12 hours a day, six days a week, you're looking at, you're looking almost 20 years of life. That's what I'm Incredible. talking about. That's, so I mean, that's huge. Like I'll more, be retired by then. Yeah, it's more than, the, it's, yeah, it's more than the lease of the space that the people are in. So yeah. just to give two different examples right here of LED fixtures, one we affectionately call the flat panel. They, they're the same size. It's the same form factor. You don't need to reconfigure your ceilings. The other fixture comes in, this drops in. The rebates on these, depending on how much wattage you're saving, could be $25 to $70 a fixture. If you add sensors, and Con Edison loves sensors, sensors basically reduce the light to 50% when no one's in a room. It could reduce it to zero when no one's in a room. Why use your lighting when no one's there? When you add sensors, you get an incentive. The other thing that's very important is to replace the lighting with architectural lighting, that you need to create the same levels of light on the surfaces. You need to have color that's good for people's eyes, color so people look good. Uh, um, color temperature is the appearance. Like fluorescent lighting is very, very cool. And mm -hmm. that's okay, but if it's an environment where you care a little more about decorative aspects and interior design, you may want a little more warmer again. Uh, what CRI is, CRI is a metric that goes from zero to 100. Uh, CRI is color rendering. How do we look? How do objects look under light? Um, the, when you see that trigain, trigain means the reds in the lighting spectrum is highlighted. Red is the most important color of the spectrum. Why? Because no matter where we're from in the world, no matter what race we are, we all have red blood under our skin. That's why people look healthy when you highlight reds in the spectrum. So when you replace the lighting, look for these things, look for good totally. CRI. And also- I think a lot of people, when they think sustainable lighting, think, you know, 50 years ago, fluorescent lighting, it was at and the we time. all hate it yeah. it gives us headaches we look terrible under it you, but this you, is you, so you, incredible i know i just replaced um everything right. in my office and yeah. and the sensors not only are they saving us money obviously and helping the environment but folks love to see that you know they love to see that when they walk into a room the lights weren't just on it you know it shows them that, that we're doing something that you're making um, a commitment yeah yeah and it just you know it's just sleek. Like everyone just loves it. Um, I think the last thing that we maybe should touch on is um, just one of my favorite little little tech yeah. aspects you've mentioned is um, the light sensors. Right. There's different technology and light sensors. Some work on sound, some work on body heat. Uh, and what's great is each individual fixture can have its own sensor. So if I'm in my cubicle, my lighting goes on, but you could also have it more sophisticated with their Bluetooth sensors where I could actually take my phone and adjust the lighting that's only over my head and not affect your Sophia in the next cubicle. Mm -hmm. The other is conference rooms. And the other thing that's big now is for wall mounts are a, a set of occupancy sensors vacancy that the light only comes on when I turn it on, but it goes off on its own. Because how many times are we dropping off a folder or something or on somebody's desk for two seconds and you walk into a room, what do you need to put the light on for that? So there's, it, it, controls is a huge, if you're not upgrading your controls with lighting, and as you can see, as we go down to that hallway fixture, you could see how adding controls to an item is up to $85 on some fixtures. That's how important it is to Con Edison for you to use controls. Because what they do is they want 
a transformational change in our attitudes mm -hmm. towards lighting and sustainability. And one more thing, because energy is so expensive in New York and labor is so expensive in New York, you get a quicker payback by anywhere in America. If that was you, my you last question. What are we ROI, looking at for the ROI? Well, put it this way. If the, if, if, the, if the average cost of energy in America is 10 cents a kilowatt hour, which is a thousand watts consumed in an hour, which is very easy to do, is 10 cents. In New York, you're in the 20, 21, 22 cents. And mm -hmm. labor rates, union electricians could be $90 an hour. You're looking at savings of within a year's payback, sometimes That's less. Great which is pretty dramatic. That sounds like a case I can make to my CFO. You know, mm -hmm. 10 years, we're not looking that far ahead. Within a and, year, I can probably do it. And every year that you hold on to the fixture after that period of time is money in your pocket. And Incredible. as our budget's a challenge right now, it's, it's a really good source. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Barry. Um, I think we're going to wrap up with this section. We've got five minutes left here. So we'll just open it up to questions from the audience. Okay. Feel free to type it in chat. Yeah, I'll turn it back over to Jess for questions. Yeah, I don't see any in the chat, um, but I have a couple of questions that I think people would be interested in. Um, <clears throat> this actually is for Al. Uh, the, the follow your print brand, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the follow your print technology, which was the, the more um, investment uh, moderate, I guess, is that brand specific? So do I have to use that with like a Canon printer or, um, or is it, can you tell me a little bit more about that Al? Sure, thanks Jessica. Um, yeah, with regards to uh, follow you print, um, it, um, it's one of those things where depending on the manufacturer, they, have may, they may have developed their own uh, solution to accomplish that. However, there are third party solutions that are out there that will uh, be able to work with any brand uh, of product that you have um, in the same manner. So, um, so I guess depending on what you may have, you're not going to be uh, limited to not being able to get this. You can get it regardless of who whose products you have. Great. Um, I also had a question. This is actually for, for Barry and also Sophia for you, um, just because you've recently done this. What is the lead time from calling your Con Ed person to come in and do an assessment to having everything installed, assuming, I mean, I know Sophia, you had a 200,000 square foot space, which is huge. Um, but let's say somebody has a 15,000 square foot space. What is the, the lead time? And, and it's unoccupied right now because everybody's working from home and you're waiting for, for folks to come back in. Are we talking about uh, four weeks, eight weeks? What is the lead time that an FM should calculate into their, into their planning? If, if I could answer that first, the first sure. thing you need to do is check stock on the available availability of the lighting fixtures. And the electrical distributors could tell you that right away. Some of these lighting fixtures are in stock already. They're just very commonly used fixtures that they keep on hand. Some of them need to be purchased. And there have been shortages, as we know, in almost everything going on now because of products that are made offshore and the shortage of containers bringing things uh, here to the States. But uh, you could deal with manufacturers that are, are here in the United States which, which would eliminate that. But the other is check with the electrical distributor. Once you have your counts, they'll tell you availability, how quickly we could get it. But I, I would say two months should be start to finish. Six weeks, eight weeks should be plenty of time. Okay, that's great. That's doable. Um, especially for people who are who are considering kind of an October or, yeah, or after even, even a Labor Day opening. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Gotcha. Absolutely. Thank you. Looks like we have one in the chat for Anne Marie. Um, what's the oh, best great. way to share sustainability updates and new procedures with staff so that they are excited and motivated to get on board? I think that's a great question. Thank you for asking, Liz. So when I'm doing larger scale projects, we actually implement a governance model where we have a team, a change team who um, we draw together representatives from different departments to participate in driving the long-term change. For something that's a, on a more short-term hit, 
I would definitely consider the idea of the contest or the prize or the gaming aspect of it that gets people naturally excited and interested. Um, sometimes it gets their competitive juices flowing to participate. Um, also use every modality. Some people are really good at reading every email. Other people respond better to video. Um, other people will go to your FAQs. So I would encourage a multi-modality communication strategy. And at the end of the day, your secret weapon for any change initiative is your leadership. Senior leadership, if you've got all teams meeting, having them highlight it. And then also giving tear sheets to managers so that when they're having their stand up all team, you know, their, their individual team meetings, they can be reinforcing and positively encouraging their, your your organization at the team level to be engaged. And I think it's helpful to have focus groups if there's an opportunity to also hear information back. We like to hear what employees think. Sometimes they have fantastic, really creative, innovative ideas. Nobody likes to just be told. So give them an opportunity either through an email inbox that will feed into your FAQs or have um, focus groups for them to give you input and insight that can just improve the program. Wonderful. So I think we've gotten to our time or a little bit over. So that's great. Um, Sophia, thank you so much, panelists. This is great. I've left your uh, contact information up. So if anybody wants to jot that down, you guys are a great resource. Um, and again, to the sponsors, if my annual sponsors, you can see their logos behind me. Thank you so much for making this happen. Okay.